There are two foundational things that we need to take into account when we deal with the plan of salvation and more specifically, the sanctuary. The first is that the sin problem is universal in scope because it originated in heaven. It did not originate on earth. Therefore, the solution to the sin problem has to also be universal in scope. You see, Lucifer was able to deceive one-third of the angels, or as Ellen White states in The Truth About Angels, page 43, nearly half of the angels. His arguments must have been deceptively persuasive to the heavenly beings. Satan smeared the character of God. He told the heavenly beings that God was a despot, that he was autocratic and dictatorial, and he wanted all of his creatures simply to be his slaves. He craved power, in other words. He claimed that God restricts freedom, that God did not create man a free moral agent. And so the purpose of the plan of salvation, as illustrated in the sanctuary, is to answer all of the accusations of Satan against God. There's a second important issue that we need to take into account when we study the plan of salvation in the sanctuary. And that is that sin not only is a universal problem, it is an earthly problem. We need to remember that God created a perfect world in seven literal days. Adam and Eve were literal individuals in a perfect literal garden. God created them with freedom of choice. And we know that Satan tempted them into sin. And they passed on the virus of sin to the entire human race. They could not dig themselves out of the pit. It was necessary for someone to come from outside human history to deliver man from his predicament. So God's redemptive solution was to take seven steps through the sanctuary. The sanctuary is God's solution to the sin problem. That's the reason why Ellen White wrote in letter 208, 1906, the following words. The correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. Once Jesus has taken his seven steps to the sanctuary, the sin problem will have been resolved. You see, the sanctuary is not a mere doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The sanctuary is the world view of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It correlates all of the doctrines of the church in a whole. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. When you put all of the pieces together, you have the sanctuary plan of salvation. Now we're going to notice in our study that we're not going to study in this first uh, subject the furniture of the sanctuary or the garments of the priest or the colors or the fabric or the measurements of the sanctuary. The speaker who follows me is going to deal with those details. We're not going to take a microscopic view of the sanctuary but a telescopic view, if you please. We're not going to look at the individual trees. We're going to look at the forest. We're not going to look at each piece of the puzzle. We're going to look at the finished puzzle. Now, I mentioned that Jesus takes seven steps to the sanctuary. Those seven steps are the following. First, he comes to our camp. He comes to dwell among us. You see, he lived for 30 years... <laughs> before he entered the court of the sanctuary. So the first step is coming to the encampment where sinners live. 
The second step is at the altar of sacrifice. The third step is at the laver. The fourth step, he moves into the holy place. The fifth step, he moves into the most holy place. The sixth step is when he goes from the most holy place and places the sins of the penitent upon the scapegoat, Azazel, at the entrance of the sanctuary. And then once the Azazel uh, sanctuary ceremony is finished, and that includes the millennial judgment and the post-millennial judgment, sin and sinners will be destroyed. And then Jesus will come to live in our camp forever. That is step number seven. So let's take a look at the seven steps. The first step is when Jesus comes to live in our camp. Now, there is no camp illustrated here. We have the holy place and the most holy place. So I want you to imagine that all of you are the sanctuary camp. And right here in this open space is the court. And then we move into the holy, and then you have there uh, above on the screen the most holy place. Now let's talk a little bit about Jesus coming to live in our camp for 30 years. Why didn't Jesus die when he was a baby? Because Jesus had developed a perfect character. He had to weave a robe of perfect righteousness by his life that he could impute and impart to us. You see, his life is as important as his death. The first problem that sinners had was nakedness. So the first solution is for Jesus to develop a robe to cover the nakedness. He came to live a righteous life in our camp in order to weave a perfect robe to cover the shame of our nakedness. Let's read John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt in the Greek is the word skenoo. It's the verbal form of the word skene, which means tent. So we could translate that. The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, that is, in the camp. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. First step, Jesus becomes flesh of our flesh to live 30 years and develop a perfect character. Now, I want us to go to Leviticus chapter 22 and verses 20 to 22, where we are told what characteristic the sacrifices had to have when they were offered in the sanctuary. Notice Leviticus chapter 20, verses 20 to 22. This is before the, the beast is sacrificed. Notice Leviticus 20, verse 20 through 22. Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow or a free will offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar of the Lord. So the death of Jesus would not have counted at all unless he was a perfect victim before his death. Not only did the sacrifice have to be without defect, but the priest also had to be without defect, the priest that offered the sacrifice. Notice Leviticus chapter 21 and verses 17 through 21. Leviticus 21, 17 through 21. Speak to Aaron saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach a man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long or a man who has a broken foot or broken hand or is a hunchback or is a dwarf 
or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scab or is a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. So there had to be a perfect victim and a perfect priest offering the victim. And Jesus is the victim and he is the priest because he offered himself. Notice what we find in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 5 on this same point. This is speaking of the Passover lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So the Passover lamb had to be without blemish. Why? Notice 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. Here the apostle Peter wrote, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as what kind of a lamb? As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you. So Jesus was represented by the lamb who had no defect. Is Jesus also a priest with no defect? Notice Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Very well known verses. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all things tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the work of Jesus in the camp. Now let's move into the court. Jesus not only had to weave a robe of righteousness to cover our nakedness, somebody had to pay for our sins. Because the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is what? Is death. So Jesus not only had to live for us, Jesus also had to die for us, bearing our sins in Gethsemane and on the cross. The sins of the entire world were placed upon him. Let's read several verses. You say, Pastor Boy, you're reading too many verses. The good thing is they're all on the screen. And by the way, if you want to get the full presentations, because I write my entire sermon, you can contact sumtv.org, and we'll be glad to send you the copies of the three sermons that I'm going to present here. Let's notice John 3.16. For God so loved, what? The world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm going to stop halfway through the verse because we're going to use the other half a little bit later. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, for he, that is the father, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be what? To be sin for us, that we might become righteousness of God in him. So Jesus was made sin. Our sins were placed upon him. He suffered the penalty that we should suffer. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And how did he do it? Having become what? A curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus took upon himself our curse. He took upon himself our sin. For how many people did Jesus do this? For every single person that has ever lived on planet Earth. Not only for those who are going to be saved. Notice Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews 2 verse 9. 
but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, but crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for Sacramento. Taste death for what? For everyone. Jesus died for every person who's ever lived. Notice 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you. He's writing to Christians, by the way, here. So that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only. In other words, he's writing to Christians, not only for that, the sins of Christians, but the sins of whom? But also for the whole world. Notice Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. Many of these verses we're very well acquainted with. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. Speaking about Jesus, the Messiah. We just finished studying Isaiah in our Sabbath school lessons. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And now listen to this. And the Lord has laid on him. Who is the Lord here? It's the Father. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So in the camp, he lives a perfect life because he have to, has to be a perfect victim. And he also has to be a perfect priest. And then he goes to the altar of sacrifice and somebody has to pay for our sins. So now Jesus takes the burden of sin upon himself at the altar of sacrifice. Ellen White wrote in volume one of Selected Messages, page 321, for how many Jesus died. This is a fantastic statement. The guilt of every sin, how many? Every sin pressed its weight upon the divine soul of the world's Redeemer. The evil thoughts, the evil words, the evil deeds of every son and daughter of Adam called for retribution upon himself, for he had become man's substitute. Though the guilt of sin was not his, his spirit was torn and bruised by the transgressions of men. And he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now listen, folks. The provision that Jesus made by his life and death is for every person who has ever lived. I call them uh, the benefits that Jesus earned in the camp and in the court, the objective aspects of the atonement. He did everything for all. He lived for all and he died for all. Now let's move to the laver. The laver was between the altar of sacrifice and the holy place of the sanctuary. What does the laver represent? Well, it comes between the altar of sacrifice and the holy place. That should uh, tell us something, right? The altar of sacrifice is the death of Christ. When did Jesus enter the holy place? At Pentecost. So it must be something that occurred between his death and Pentecost, the labor. Go with me to Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Titus 3, verses 4 and 5. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, now listen carefully, through the washing of regeneration. What do you use to wash things? Water. And what does the water do? It what? Regenerates. That's an interesting word in Greek. It's palingenesia, which means to have life again, to live again. So what would the labor represent? It would represent the resurrection of Christ. 
So it continues saying, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he cleansed himself from every vestige of death, of the defilement of death forever and ever. Romans 6 verses 9 and 10 tells us, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So the labor represents the resurrection of Christ. If Christ had not resurrected, none of us could be forgiven. Did you hear what I said? If Jesus had not resurrected, none of us could experience forgiveness or what theologians call justification. You say, well, how do you know that? Let's go to Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Romans 4 verse 25. This is talking about when God justified Abraham by faith. It says, now it was not writ written for his sake only that it was imputed to him, in other words, credited to his account, but also for us, for it shall be imputed to us who what? Who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, that's his death, and was raised for our what? He was raised for our justification. Justification and forgiveness are the same thing. Could we have been forgiven just by the death of Christ? No. The answer is no. How important is the resurrection of Christ? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 7. Some people might be wondering, Pastor Boy, we couldn't be forgiven uh, just by the death of Christ? No. That's what the Bible says. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 7. Here the Apostle Paul states, For I delivered to you, first of all, which I, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again, the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep, and after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. And now let's go to verse 17. Listen carefully. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Did the death of Christ forgive sin? Without his resurrection? No, because it says, if Christ is not risen, your faith is, faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Are you following me? Now we're going to move to the holy place. Let's go to the second half of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to save everybody on the planet. No. Many people forget the last half of the verse. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. By his life and death, Jesus bought the gift of salvation. But we must accept the gift or else it will not benefit us. Let me give you an illustration. Imagine an owner of a bank who sees all of these people on planet Earth who are in debt. He's a multi-quatrillionaire. He's got unlimited resources. He says, I feel so sorry for all those human beings here on Earth that are so indebted. I'm going to deposit enough money in the bank to pay everyone, every person's debts on planet Earth. How many people do you think would be in line? I think the line would go several times around the world. 
But anyway, he says, I'm going to deposit enough money to pay for all mortgages, all credit cards, department store bills, educational loans, auto loans, the works. And the owner of the bank announces that to everyone on planet Earth. There's only one catch. And that is you have to come and make the withdrawal. What happens if you don't make the withdrawal of the capital that he deposited in the bank? You are still in debt. You see, Jesus deposited, so to speak, in the bank of heaven, enough capital to forgive the sins of everyone on planet Earth, but only those who come to him claiming the benefit of what he won will eventually be saved and their debt canceled. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have what? An advocate with the Father. Would Jesus have to resurrect to be our advocate? Yes, of course. And if anyone, anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's important. Jesus, who is the advocate? Jesus Christ the righteous. When he goes before the Father, he says, I come representing Pastor Bohr. I'm just dramatizing for effect. The father says, where is Pastor Bohr? Jesus says, Pastor Bohr doesn't have to be here. He's accepted in the beloved. Don't look at his unrighteousness. Look at my righteousness. He's repented. He's confessed his sins. Accept him in me. That's what Jesus does in heaven when he entered the holy place of the sanctuary. Notice Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. It says there, therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost. Who? Listen, those who come to God through him. Who are the ones that he's able to save? Those who come to God through Jesus. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Who is them? those who come to God through him in the holy place. You know, there's this idea that Jesus forgave everyone's sins at the cross. Mm -mm. The Bible does not teach that. You say, really? Notice Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Are there conditions for receiving forgiveness? Yes, there are. You see, Jesus gained the benefits by his perfect life and his death. But when we come to him, Confessing our sins, repenting, and having faith in him, he takes what he did objectively and he applies it to us subjectively or personally. Acts 2.38. This is at the end of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Don't get all caught up with the word remission. It means forgiveness. It's translated forgiveness in other texts in the New Testament. So when do we receive forgiveness? When Jesus died on the cross? No. It says here, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, Jesus, when he went to heaven, he's accepting clients. Notice two or three other verses. Acts 5, verse 31. Speaking about Jesus, it says, it says uh, Him, God has exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior. This is on the day of Pentecost. Why did He go up there? To give what? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. What did Jesus go to heaven to do? To give what? Forgiveness for sins. Repentance and forgiveness for sins. Notice Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. Acts 10, verse 43. It says, speaking about Jesus, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever what? Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So Jesus forgives sins in the holy place. He applies his life and death when we come to him in repentance, confession, and faith. You all know that famous verse, 1 John 1, 9. 
if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to what? Oh, so there's, this is a personal, isn't confession of sin personal? Yes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you're all acquainted with Proverbs 28 and verse 13, where it says, he who covers his sins will not pass prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Let me read you a couple of statements from Ellen White. Christ's Object Lessons, page 311. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering, the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every whom? Every repenting, believing soul. Does the Bible teach that? We just noticed it. Notice the faith I live by, page 107. The grace of Christ is freely to justify the sinner without merit or claim on his part. Justification is a full, complete pardon of sin. And now I love this part. The moment a sinner accepts Christ by faith, that moment he is pardoned. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to him. That's a theological word. It means that it is credited to his account. And he is no more to doubt God's forgiving grace. When did God place, when, when did the father place the robe on the prodigal son? After the son repented and he came home and confessed. I'm sorry, dad. Then his father places the robe upon him. Now, I don't have time to read the next couple of statements that I have in my notes. I'm just going to mention them. In the story of redemption, page 386, I'm going to only read the last part of the quotation. Ellen White wrote, Jesus had entered by his, by his own blood, this is at Pentecost, to shed upon his disciples, not everyone in the world, upon his disciples, the benefits of his atonement. What are the benefits of his atonement? His life and his death are the benefits. But we're going to go in a moment to the most holy place ministry. There, Jesus does not pour out the benefits of his atonement, but he actually determines who is entitled to the benefits by a work of judgment. I'll just read the last part of uh, The Faith I Live by, page 206. This necessitates an examination of the books of record to determine who, through repentance of sin and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. See, now he pours out the benefits on the Day of Atonement. He actually examines the cases of those who claim Jesus to see if they're really entitled to those benefits. Now let's move into the work of Jesus in the most holy place, of the sanctuary. And I'm going to summarize some things here because I think we're well acquainted with the ministry of Jesus in the most holy place. It's spoken of in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. Unto 2,300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now let me ask you this. How do we know if a person is truly sorry for sin and truly repentant and is confessing the sin rather than simply admitting it. We're saved by grace through faith, but our works reveal if our faith is genuine. That's why even though we're saved by grace through faith, we are judged by works, because works show whether our faith, faith is real or not. And so in the judgment, the only cases that are examined are those who claim to have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Not the worldlings. That happens during the thousand years. Everyone who remain behind, Satan, his angels, and the wicked, their cases are examined during the thousand years and after the thousand years. 
But in the pre-advent investigative judgment, only those who at one time claim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, their cases are examined to determine if their faith and their repentance and their confession was genuine or not. And I know what probably you're thinking. Doesn't God already know? Yes, God knows. But God is solving the problem before creatures who don't know. Let me ask you this. Does the church have wheat and tares? Do the tares claim to be followers of Jesus? Yes. Does the church have good and bad fish? Yes. Not all the fish that go into the boat are good fish. Let me ask you, in the church are there wise and foolish virgins? Oh yes, of course. Does the wedding hall gather all types so that there's an individual who comes in into the uh, chamber for the wedding and the king comes out and says, how did you get in here without a garment? By the way, that's not after the second coming when somebody sneaked into heaven. That's the pre-advent investigative judgment. Somebody who claimed that they were followers of Jesus but did not have the robe. Let me ask you, are there those who say, Lord, Lord, who are going to be lost? Absolutely. Jesus is going to say, even though you cast out demons, even though you perform miracles, even though you, you did everything in my name, I never knew you. Depart from me, you transgressors of the law, because that's the best translation of the word there. It's the word anomias. Let me ask you, even among the clergy, are there individuals who claim to be ministers of righteousness, but they're not? Yes. Are there people in the church who have the form of godliness, but lack the power of godliness? Yes. So is it necessary to perform a work of separation of those who were true believers from counterfeit believers? Absolutely. That's what happens in the most holy place. And those who are true believers, once their case is examined, their sins are blotted from the sanctuary. That's good news. Are you following me so far? Now let's go to step number six. You see, the cleansing of the most holy place was not the last work of Jesus. Once the sanctuary has been cleansed of all of the sins of the truly penitent, then Jesus is going to take all of those, the, all of the record of that, those sins that defiled the sanctuary as people confessed their sins and repented and trusted in Jesus. All those sins went in. They were forgiven sins. You don't have to worry that they're up there. Some people say, oh, I don't like the idea that my sins are written up there. It takes away my assurance. Listen, if they're not there, they're here. So you better make sure you put them up there. Because if you're if you're sincere, if you love Jesus, if you truly are repentant and you confess your sins and you have faith in Jesus, you can be sure that those sins will be taken out of the sanctuary. And so the priest would leave the most holy place and he would take all those, that record of sins and waiting at the entrance of the sanctuary in the court was a zazel, a symbol of whom? A symbol of Satan. And all of the sins, by the way, the scapegoat does not die for sin. The sins were already forgiven by the blood of the first goat. Are you with me? And so forgiven sins to the sinner are placed upon Azazel and he must suffer the final responsibility for being the originator and the perpetuator of sin. And then Satan is exiled on this earth for a thousand years. By the way, the Day of Atonement includes the thousand years, the post-millennial judgment, as well as the destruction of Satan, his angels, and the wicked. All of that is contemplated in the Day of Atonement. I don't have time to go into the de details on that. But the, the Zazel ceremony includes not only the, taking the sins that cleanse the sanctuary and placing them upon the head of the scapegoat, it includes also the judgment during the thousand years. Let me ask you, are there going to be some people missing up there that uh, we expected to be there for sure? Are there going to be people there that we never expected to see there? 
<laughs> oh, yes. There's going to be questions. God said, okay, I'm going to open the books. I'm going to show you the records. You tell me. But notice how wonderful God is. In the pre-advent judgment, he convinces all of the heavenly beings that he has a right to take his people home. That's, that's why the judgment has to be before the second coming, folks. Because Jesus has to reveal before the heavenly universe who he has a right to come to earth to take the heaven. There's no urgency with the wicked. Because the wicked, their cases are going to be examined afterwards. And so during the thousand years, God's people will be able to see what was seen in the pre-advent judgment. And then all of the redeemed will be convinced that God acted correctly. But there's one group that's still not convinced. Satan, his angels, and the wicked. And if I had time, I would show you in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, where after the millennium, there is this great panoramic view above the holy city. And each person outside the city, Satan, his angels, and the wicked, each one of them will see the record of their lives. And after they've seen the record of their lives, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Satan, his angels, and the wicked have been persuaded that God was right. It took this long process. See, God doesn't, God doesn't resolve things quickly, hastily. God takes his time. Praise the Lord that he takes his time. And so after all of them had confessed that God was right and Satan was wrong, even Ellen White states that even Satan will kneel and confess that God acted correctly. For once the entire universe is in harmony again, everybody agrees that God was right. And then of course Satan, his angels, and the wicked are destroyed. And God makes a new heavens and a new earth. And now comes the most exciting part. The Jesus who came in the first coming to live and die for us will now abide in our camp forever and ever. Let's read our final passage. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 and verses 2 through 4. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down, down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, listen carefully now, the tabernacle of God is with men. Remember he came to tabernacle with us the first time? Now it says the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will what? The capital of the universe, folks. Little old itsy bitsy planet Earth. Don't miss it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And so it continues saying, And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. The controversy has ended. And the whole universe is at peace and in perfect harmony. Father in heaven, we thank you for having been with us in our study this evening. I ask, Lord, that you will touch each heart of those who are gathered here today, including myself. Oh, Lord, help us not to throw away eternity for earthly pleasures. Help us, Lord, to feel that our sins cause separation between us and you. Give us repentance. Help us to confess our sins to trust in Jesus 
so that we might be found among those who will dwell in your presence for eternity. Thank you, Father, for having been with us and for answering our prayer. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.